Saints fans and who that's from all over the world. This is Kyle T. Mosley of Saints News Radio, and I'm bringing you the Crescent City Connection. I'm here with the professional tonight, Mr. Remy Jones. What's happening, Rim? Oh, man, I'm doing good. I'm, um, my pressure is going back down after that um, second half Sunday. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I, you know, we won, and I'm all smiles because, you know, um, the real Falcons showed up and did what they do best. They blew that 17 point lead um, in, a, in the second half. And, you know, it looked like we were trying to do the same thing for a yeah, minute. But we, we came around. Close. But, you know, but you, you can't outdo the Falcons when it comes to that kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's done, I'm doing well. It's hump day, and um, I'm ready for some more football this weekend. So let's get it on. Let's get it on, baby. Look, Rem, I was thinking about you when that lead started dwindling down. I was like, oh, God. If we lose this game, <laughs> Rem can't put it to those Falcons fans anymore, man. It was getting kind of well, close there. I, I could have, man, because one, it's not the Super Bowl, and two, it's not Jay Cutler. <laughs> I mean, they did it in the Super Bowl, and they did it with Jay, against Jay Cutler. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, no, it's no sense to let um, Matt Stafford do that to you. But Jay Cutler? Jay Cutler, bro. Jay Cutler. Come on, man. Jay, Jay brought them back. Well, I think it was what? Was it 17-0? 17-0, and they didn't score at all in the second half. Oh, my goodness. At home. Yeah. In, in, at home. At home in it, that brand new. Uh, in that brand new Chinese dome. takeout. Um, <laughs> The, the Ari- brand new Chinese takeout um, container, yeah, that they play that, in now. That origami dome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever that thing is. Yeah, they went from a, they went from a circus tent to an origami. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> man, it, look. In another thing, man, the lighting in that place is just crazy, man. It is just, it? Yeah, is it? it just all looks I know, like man, is, you, all I know is that three and oh, man, three stadium, zero championships. That's all I know. Ah, yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> all right, guys, man, if you missed it this Sunday, the New Orleans Saints hosted the Detroit Lions in the Mercedes Benz Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana, right. and the Saints were victorious over the Lions 52 to 38. The defense accounted for 21 of those points. Man, and it was a very, very good showing for our boys in black and gold. Remy, still, we have some issues that we need to talk about a little bit. But all in all, the Saints are going up to Lambeau Field this Sunday against the Aaron Less Rodgers (laughs) and the Packers uh, up there, man. So... The Saints have a chance to to figure it out. Is it time to make the leap in the NFC and be able to cause some chaos against some of our opponents in the next few weeks? But they got to take care of business one game at a time. And before right. we go on to that, guys, don't forget, you can read all of Barry Hurst's uh articles on www.saintsnewsnetwork.com Barry is the featured columnist there and you can check us out as well on www.saintsnews.net for all of the Saints News 24-7 you can also hit us up on Facebook as well as Twitter and Instagram at Saints News also don't forget keep praying for Coach Rick Gailey Uh, Coach, if you don't know, the past several weeks he hasn't been with us because he is battling uh, cancer, and he's gone through his third round of chemo. So just keep him in your prayers. All right, Rim, uh, how how does everybody feel down in the Big Easy after this big win? 
Well, man, I can honestly say it's, it's, it's a whole different attitude now, man. It's not, you know, we put together three wins in a row. You know, understandably, after the first two games, uh, everybody was a bit down, but everybody's looking up now since we won, we have three games in a row. And two, the defense is looking much better. Now, you know, you got these New Orleans people, they're a bit brainwashed. They can't see when the offense isn't doing well for some reason. I don't know. But um, but they can see that the defense is playing much, much better. So with that, there's a lot more optimism in the city. People are happy. You know, we're in second place in the division now. Um you know, we're not we're no longer um behind anyone. If 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 we can get one more game, one more loss from what's that team, Carolina, you know, we'll actually be leading the division. And then when we look at our schedule that we have coming, um, we have a very good chance of making a run if the team keeps playing the way they're doing. Yeah. Especially if our offense can put together a few first downs. Yeah. So the the optimism is, is really there right now, man. The 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 attitude has changed Totally from two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, you're right, man. Not only that, I mean, you've got to look at what the defense is doing to say, wow, if the defense can continue to just be a little bit more consistent to play with the, the aggressiveness that we need them to play with. Because when you're young, you've got to do a little bit more and, and be aggressive uh, versus playing with a lot of skill at this point uh the skill is going to develop over time but i really believe what we see in the defense has to be highly encouraging to the team now what's concerning to me is the team left a lot of points off the board offensively as well as we were not consistent as we should have been when it came down to running out the clock Sean Payton, I, I'm still, I'm, I, I'm, I don't know what to say. When we had every opportunity on two consecutive drives to at least take some time off the clock, here is Payton trying to throw the football again, Rim, and that was yeah. just, uh, you know, one of those head scratching things. You, you got to really wonder why this team is not as consistent right now on offense now people will say well kyle you know they they scored 31 points true that no they didn't no they didn't go ahead why didn't they yeah well the defense scored um 21 of them right 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 so the defense scored 21 so you subtract 21 from 31 what you get it, you know, no, the, the, the defense is, the, uh, yeah, was in, it was just not good, you know, production from the offense, especially yeah, in the second right, half. Right, they exactly. couldn't put together um, a consistent drive. They couldn't, you know, they were, they were getting off that field so fast. And if it hadn't been for the defense with the deflected passes and the interceptions and things of that nature, um, that game could have gotten ugly the other way. Right, right, exactly. could have turned the other way. Exactly. You, you know, and one thing that you also saw is that when we needed to make these first downs, man, it just wasn't as consistent as we have been in the past. You know, uh, the Saints on third down, man, it, it just seemed like what's really happening with the team. Our efficiency at home was just 17 percent. We were two of 12 on third down at home. Right. That's and see, that's another thing people overlook, you know. Yeah, they did score some points, but they made some big plays. But they didn't put together any drives. Exactly. You know, that right. that that's that's missing. Those those drives where you keep the team on the field. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure you love those um quick scores as you know as much as I do. But when you do that too quickly and then you put the other team back on on the field if, if that defense isn't playing the way they're playing, um, and our offense keeps, you know, having the type of trouble that they were having, complete, putting drives together, that that can quickly turn the game around. Right. And you know that was a big issue we've had. That's another issue we've had the few past few years that people kept, um, kept over and continue to overlook. They're looking at how many points they're putting up. They're not putting, looking at how they're putting up the points. You know, so you got to really um, be able to stay on the field. Convert third, convert off third down, and um, put some drives together, and keep our defense off the field, and then put the points up. Right, right, exactly, man. 
look at it like this, Remy. All right, we the first possession, five plays, out, punt. Right. The next possession, we only had four plays. We gained 75 yards on those four plays, touchdown. Next possession, we had nine plays, 74 yards, field goal. Six uh, plays, the next possession, touchdown. 11 plays, but that was only 31 yards to get a touchdown. Next possession, 11 plays, 75 yards, touchdown. Then the end of the half, we only had one play. Not in the second half, the Saints only had one possession where they had seven plays and it led to a touchdown. Every other possession was interception, fumble, punt, punt, Interception, punt, punt, punt. That's the concern, who that nation, right there. The second half, if it were not for the defensive scores, we would have been in a whole lot of trouble, babe. Yeah, yeah. And and I like that, Um, you know, our, our offense is turning the ball over very little. We only had, what, two this game? Yeah, and that one was questionable with the Michael Thomas uh, – Catch yes, that these guys yes. claim was an interception. You, you were all. I grew up, man, and I know you grew up. Offense always. If you got the ball, it always goes yes. to the offense. I go to the offense, right? So I and I it, you know, Rem. I just don't know, man. With all the technology we have, right? All of the different camera angles that is available to the National Football League and these referees. Why is it that they cannot get these calls right any longer, man? They still can't get it right. Well, I was listening to um, Bobby Deke, Bobby and Deke um, earlier in the week. And, no, it wasn't even their show, but it was on the same station. I don't remember who it was. But somebody said that they think that the referees have a subconscious. Not that they're cheating, but, like, if they're, in, they're watching a game and – Detroit is down by 35 points. Subconsciously, they're thinking there's no way they should be down by 35 points, so something has to be wrong. So they see things <laughs> in a way that you know they probably wouldn't see it otherwise. Okay. And so um, when they looked at that replay, I'm willing to bet that's something that happened where it was just a subconscious thing where, well, it, there's no way they're down by this many points, so he must have really intercepted that ball. So <laughs> this is what I saw. That's all I can explain. That's the only way I can explain it because I saw a complete pass, a completed pass. That was um, very questionable. Now, there's no, no question about that other interception. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One. Well, yeah, Drew, I don't know what he was doing on that one, man. But I think that was a great defensive play more than anything else. I wouldn't even put that on Drew. And you know I'm not I'm, – I'll give, I'll give Drew hell when, I, when I, he has it coming to him. But I think that was just an amazing defensive play by a big man who – saw an opportunity to get up and catch a pass with a low trajectory and you know and he had good hands and he grabbed it you know I, I, I would just give that to a good defensive play I wouldn't even put that on Drew yeah it doesn't hurt that you're 6'5 as well right <laughs> right 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 <laughs> yeah but man look I, I don't know man it, it was kind of clear to see that Michael Thomas had the football uh, the the cornerback came in he held the ball. They went down to the ground. If you, Now, there you go. There's possession yeah. as you go down to the ground, and he still yeah. has the football, right? It wasn't a simultaneous catch. It, he caught the ball. Then the guy came in to put his hands on the ball. Then he went down. I could tell if it, if it was simultaneous, you could probably say, all right, there's some question here. Then you can tell also the guy kicked him off and, and, and yeah. so he can get the ball. I mean, I'm, I don't know what these guys are looking at. And all of these replays are not only called on the field by the, the ref, but up in New York. So you know New York ain't, ain't for the Saints. No, they're not. <laughs> so uh, anyway, man, it, it's just one of those questionable calls. Um that really was a head scratcher, man. But our offense, uh, you know, a lot of people were talking about how Adrian Peterson, the, 
went out to the desert and he he won NFL Offensive Player of the Week this week with his two touchdowns and 132 yards. But Mark Ingram and Kamara still held it down, guys. Um, you know, the Saints' rushing attack was able to put over 193 yards total. Uh, we can't forget that uh, Ted Ginn also contributed to the total there. I mean, that's pretty good, especially this is the first time in years that the Saints eclipsed Drew Brees in net rushing over his passing. He only had 186 yards, real. Right. That's, that's different, but that's what happens when you can balance the output. You know, yeah. balance the runs in the um in the pass and that can happen from time to time. But if you pass it all of the time, that's not gonna happen. Uh but these guys, man, were ripping it up. I mean the and the blocking was outstanding. The holes that these guys had were amazing. You know, and as far as Adrian Peterson goes, man, I love you. Uh you know, it didn't work out here, but I don't think there's a single who that that hates Adrian Peterson. Right. And um to see him have the success he had this week, man. No power to you. I love you, man. And keep it up. Just don't do it against us. <laughs> exactly, man. Um, look, man, I'm looking at the Saints. Their red zone efficiency was really good. We were 100% this game. Three out of three for touchdowns, goal to go situations. We were three out of three. They had some little razzle dazzle on that fourth down to pick up uh, the first down. I mean, we did some, some good things, man. Uh, but still, I'm still concerned about that consistency. We cannot go down the stretch. Let's say Aaron Rodgers was playing this week. You cannot do that against a team like the Green Bay Packers. You cannot no, you do that. You know, really, most teams in the National Football League, you cannot be as inconsistent, especially that, that second half the way our offense was inconsistent. And guys, we got to be able to pay attention to that, Rim, you know? Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. But they, um, yeah, you, I mean, you said it all. There's no reason to dwell on that. You said it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, special teams, man, didn't look that special. We gave up a punt return. That's the first time in over a year the Saints gave up a punt return to a opponent, and it happened at one of the most opportune and one of the tense times on – Sunday in the fourth quarter. Uh, the Detroit Lions were making a way back into the game, and the Saints were trying to look like give the game away, <laughs> so to speak. But uh, I think right now, man, if our defense continues to hold tight and the Saints are able to continue to hold tight against teams like we have in the schedule, uh, we have to – Green Bay Packers, of course. I, I mentioned that earlier. Then after that, we played the Bears at home and the Buccaneers at home. And no, the Buccaneers. Yeah, Buccaneers at home. Then we go up to Buffalo and play the Bills on the road. And then we come back home and play the Redskins. And then we go and play the Rams. Now, that's the game that's going to be scary there. The yeah. Rams. That team looks really good this season, man. Young, aggressive coach, young, aggressive team. Kind of reminds me of what the Saints looked like back in 2006 when uh, Sean Payton took over. Yeah, they're, they're, they're looking really really good. I don't know if it's the um, new location or back to the old location or what, but the Rams are um, looking rather strong. I mean, I don't put them up there in that powerhouse level yet, but I do put them in that that's a dangerous team that you don't want to take likely category. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, let's kind of talk a little bit about this. Did you see anything different? How Sean Payton schemed the, the offense that could have uh, given us that lackadaisical effort in the second half. Second half, he went away from the game plan he had in the first half. It seemed to me, uh, mm -hmm. if you got, the, the um, running backs running the way they are, keep giving them the ball. Why throw? You know, why risk interceptions? Why risk um, the ball hitting the ground and stopping the clock? Mm -hmm. The clock is your friend when you have a 35-point lead. So uh, to me, it's, it, you should have kept running the ball with the guys, 
you know, running a dump off pass every now and then, just like he did in the first half, every now and then go for that big play. But um, to me, it just seemed like he got away from what was working. Yeah. But, you know, that's his M.O., man. He usually does that all the time, man. Uh, especially when we have a, a lead, it seems like now it's time to throw the ball. No, yeah. No, no. You know, when it should be just the opposite. Yeah. You know, it was like um, I, I was thinking while I was watching the game, I was thinking of back in the days when we had Bobby Abair as our quarterback. One thing Bobby Abair was excellent at was milking the clock, taking as much time. Because, you know, of course, that back then the team was more defensive oriented. You know, so – you needed to take as much time off the clock when we had the lead as possible, and that, he was great at that. They would not run, they would not snap that ball until it was like less than five seconds on the play clock, and they did that consistently every single play. These guys are running the next play with twelve seconds left on the play clock, and you're up by thirty-five. Make the milk that sucker. Yeah, you know, take as much time off that clock as you can, and keep that ball in bounds and keep it moving. Uh, and I was man. I'm bald here, so I can't say I was pulling my hair out. But um, I was really going nuts when they were doing it. I was like, come on, run the ball. You know? <laughs> hey, hey, Rem, I'm right there with you, man. We were growing here. That's the that's what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, man, I, I agree with you, man. We, we just got to have a little bit more consistency. And he has to trust his running efforts, man. And not only that, I think the Saints did a lot better – versus running on the inside that second half, if they would have continued to run outside with some of those sweeps and uh, some of those edge plays, I think they were doing a whole lot better, and he got away from that in the second half. Uh, right. BB, this is BB. Brendan Boylan is in the house. What's going on? How's everything out there in Carolina? Man, it's all right. I just got done with a network broadcast of women's soccer, so I'm joining a little late. I can't stay for long. Either have a lot uh, on my plate throughout the rest of the week, but I feel like I haven't talked to you guys in a long time, and I feel like, uh, of course, I can join. The Saints are playing some good ball. I got to listen to you guys talk a little bit about running the ball. You know, that's something I've kind of hung my hat on over the last few years is that, especially after Ingram got that deal, the four years, $16 million dollars, and you go and you trade a sec, essentially a second-round pick straight up for Alvin Kamara, why aren't you running the ball? Hmm. Uh, it was weird. You know, the team looked completely different there in the second half. I think Mark Ingram alluded to it when he spoke to Deion Sanders shortly after the game on NFL Network was that they, uh, to quote Mark, they were tripping. Hmm. They didn't know what was going on. Really? He said and that. that? Really? Wow that they were tripping. They didn't know what was going on. They were in a funk. And it seems like one of those easy fixes. And it was, well, do do what you were doing in the first half. You were running the ball effectively. Heck, you know, everybody wants to jump out on Adrian Peterson. What kind of a day he had out in Arizona with his 120-plus rushing yards and two touchdowns. And how, oh, well, the Saints were just underutilizing him. Well, look what the Saints did without him, without those extra – six, seven, eight carries, you get five more carries for Mark. You get a few more touches for Alvin Kamara. And combined, they ran for 170-plus yards. And you take into account Ingram's all-purpose yards, which is a stat that I love to bring up, is that he had 150 all-purpose yards, and Kamara had close to 85 all-purpose yards, if not more closer to 90. Mm -hmm. That's a heck of a day from your back. That's 250 yards. From your running backs, and, and so you have to throw in Ted Ginn as well with with those jet sweeps. Right, absolutely. So you're looking at a team where, especially when it came to the Adrian Peterson thing, I think it really did benefit both teams. It was a clean breakup, which is kind of an oxymoron. But I felt the Saints did really well. I think the Saints that we saw in the first half. That was the most excited I'd been watching a game, not just as an analyst, but as a fan as well, for the first time in a long time. Because hmm. I felt like we looked like a team that went to the Super Bowl. We looked like a team that set offensive uh, single-season records in NFL history. We looked like a team that could go into Philadelphia and beat Philadelphia on the road in the playoffs. 
you know, I'm talking about 09, 11, and 13. And I know, Saints fan, you want to live in those glory days, and you want to say, oh, well, Kamara's just like Bush, or Kamara's just like Sproles. We can't fit people into molds like that. But it was certainly entertaining to watch that Saints team do that. Now you can say, well, Brendan, what about the Saints team that put up 50-plus points against the Giants? Well, the Giants weren't really a contending team at that point. Mm-hmm. Well, Brendan, what about the, the Saints team last year that put up 40-plus points on the Rams? Well, the Rams weren't really a contending team last year. Mm-hmm. But I look at the 52 points that you put up against the Lions and the fashion that you did that. The Lions, a team that, especially with Aaron Rodgers out, could easily win the NFC North, has the highest-paid quarterback in NFL history in Matthew Stafford, and barring the fact that they had a few guys hurt, this is a team that I thought could go 11-5, and five, win the NFC North even with Aaron Rodgers. In. So they went and they did that. They're the first team since 2004 to score three defensive touchdowns in a game. If you're looking at all these numbers, the, the one that got me, Kyle, was the Saints put up 52 points on Sunday. Right. And Drew Brees did not throw for 200 yards. Right. First time at home in what? Was it over 40-something games, right? That he doesn't throw at least 200 yards. Correct. Right. And that's the crazy thing. You typically say, oh, Drew didn't throw for 200 yards. Well, if that's the case in the Saints lost, no, the Saints scored 52 points. And, you know, a lot of people talked about it when we brought AP in was that you're going to see Brees drop off yard-wise if the backs can be as effective as we hope they are. Mm-hmm. that's fine. If Kamara and Ingram want to combine for about 250 yards every week and we have Drew thrown for 200 yards and two touchdowns, that might hurt my fantasy team, but, man, I'm A-OK with that. I'm well, A-OK. No, with let me ask you this, Brendan, because I know you... – do you think the, 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 the team right now, man – and I hate to say anything negative because I know these guys – in who that nation go crazy even when we win. You can't say anything bad about the team. <laughs> Man, I, I just still feel this offense is not clicking on all cylinders. Remy and I were talking about that early before you came on. It just doesn't seem like they are still – they're not even at 90% in my opinion. Well, you know, I think that you, you both, you and Remy, state a very good point. Now, I like playing devil's advocate, so I'll do that here, is that you look at the Saints and you look at the injuries that the Saints have had early in the season on the offensive side of the ball, right? You lose Zach Streif and you lose Teron Armstead. You're both your starting tackles, and you're moving pieces around, and especially with young offensive linemen. Pete finally found a home at left guard. Well, guess what? He had to start at left tackle. Mm -hmm. And you have Ramchek, who is supposed to be the future at right tackle, but he's starting at both tackle positions. You have Willie Sneed, who's suspended through the first three weeks of the season. You have Adrian Peterson, who, even though it wasn't public, you could tell he was, and it did get public at some point, but you could tell his frustrations, right? Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with a new offensive line, a new system. Remember, Teddy Ginn, this is his first year in the system. So you look at the first couple weeks of the season, and the only receivers that are really familiar with the system that got touches last year were Michael Thomas and Brandon Coleman. Mm-hmm. So I'll give the Saints a pass there, a little bit of a pass. I hear you guys out. They don't look like they're clicking. I think they clicked a lot there in the first half. Now I know, I know what what the professor said all the time, and I know <laughs> Sean Payton isn't the most popular person in the world sometimes when it comes to this show. But maybe it is a play calling issue, especially in the second half. You know, throwing the ball. Well, look what the Falcons did when they threw the ball in the second half with a lead. But I really do think for the first time you see the Saints go out and you have that 35 point lead. And yes, the defense made plays. The defense made a lot of plays, made a lot easier on Drew in the offense. But at the same time, Ingram had a 51 yard touchdown run. Teddy Ginn across the middle on the drag for the 20 yard touchdown where he just turned on the Jets. I think you got to give it time. I think you got to let everybody get healthy. I think this is the best spot we've seen the Saints in in a long time. And if you listen to Drew's uh, postgame presser, you could even tell in his voice, and he stated it himself, was, yeah, we got the win. Yeah, we put up 52 points. But I'm still not happy because I don't feel 
the offense is where it needs to be. Right. Well, and, and I'm, I don't want to belabor the point as well, but I got to just say this to you, Bryn. Uh, that second half, Saints only on their second and third possession, that second half out of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. They had 16 possessions in the second half, and they only scored – once. I mean, 16 possessions total in the, the game. So in the second half, they had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 times. That, that's a concern. You hit 11 times, 11 touches, and you only score twice. That's a concern. No, no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. You know, I think the one thing that a lot of people take for granted, especially in the NFL more than anything, because college football, you get a ton of possessions. In the NFL, you don't get a ton of possessions. There's some games you don't even get 10 possessions because that's just how the flow of the game is. When you get 11 in one half, that's a blessing. Right. It means your defense is doing great things. So, as an offense, talk about complementary football. It's an elementary right there. you got to complement your defense because they gave you the ball 11 times and put some points on the board. Reward those guys for what they did. I hear you guys out. Yeah. It's an issue and it needs to be addressed. I think it will be addressed. I think this is a great opportunity they have next week to address that issue. Right? Because you're playing Brent Hudley, Hundley rather. Aaron Rodgers is hurt. You're playing in Lambeau. And I don't know how it is down in Louisiana and Texas right now, but in Carolina, it was 44 degrees last night. Oh. Now they're playing in the middle of the day, but Wisconsin's cold. Well, so you probably don't want to throw the ball that much. Right. And and the ground game has to be very important out there on the road. Oh, absolutely. You look at the years where the Saints had been effective out on the road. What they do well, they ran the ball well. So here's an opportunity to go, okay, Sean, if you guys can get out to an early lead, protect it and run the football or close the game out. Remember when AP got signed, everybody said, oh, well, Adrian Peterson's going to be the closer. We didn't really get to see that. Well, Ingram – won this job, Kamara won more touches. Let them show you they can close the game out because it's not Drew's job to do that. For one, play calling-wise, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But two, when you spend so much money and you invest so much into that backfield, like I said, a second-round pick for Alvin Kamara because, remember, they had to trade back in that third round. They gave up a second-round pick for next year. And the money, you're giving Mark Ingram $4 million a year. I know that doesn't sound a lot like a lot with how much these quarterbacks are making. Well, that's going to top half of what running backs make. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to invest that much, run the ball. I was proud to see that Ingram got 25 carries the last game. But the crazy thing is you, you can sit there and say, well, he should have gotten more. One yeah. thing that I'm interested to see – what we've seen so many roster moves for the Saints. Uh, you know, Michael Maudy come Maudy coming back today. He saw a couple cuts. I don't think we truly have a backup for Mark Ingram. Now, I know that sounds silly. Some people say, oh, we'll just use Alvin Kamara. Well, what if Ingram goes down? Worst case scenario, what if Ingram goes down? This is a guy who's been injury prone throughout his career, right? Well, you have Edmonds on the team. But there's one player that's a free agent right now that I'd be interested to see the Saints bring back. Hightower? <laughs> I was going to say Tim Hightower. Yeah. If he's available and wants to play, he knows the system. You saw how he ran last year. Why not give him a call? Yeah. I thought the same thing because last it, week when I, I saw him. He did a workout he posted oh, on Instagram. I was like, wow, he still looks good. He doesn't have a lot of wear and tear. We know what he can do when given the opportunity, right? So – yeah, why not him, Tim Hightower? Now, see, they brought back uh, Daniel Lasko, took him off of the practice squad and brought him back onto the uh, the regular squad. Well, see, that's an interesting thing, and that's another reason why you look at the statistics from the last game. You see Ingram got the ball 25 times. You see Kamara got 10 carries in that game. You said, well, the Saints still could have ran the ball more. Well, remember, Edmonds is really a special teams player, right? Mm -hmm. So you're really looking at only having two available backs on Sunday. That's right. And they combined for 35 carries. 
which is a lot, especially in a Sean Payton offense. That's a lot. You're saying all the Saints run the ball more. I think with a third back, if you see a similar situation where the Saints are up, let's say even it's just for giggles, say they're up by three possessions. Or maybe it's a 17-point game. I think with a third back, you'll see the ball be ran more because 25 carries, that's a lot. You're getting beat up, you're getting banged up. Ingram has the second most yards after contact per carry in the league behind Alex Collins at 3.2. You know how Ingram is as a runner. Yeah. Kamara, you don't want to be feeding him up the gut. You don't want to give him the, especially a A-gap. Yes, he's a powerful runner, but man, you don't want that guy to get hurt because of the versatility that he has. So you bring in a guy like Lasko, who is a big guy. I remember saying that with you guys when we brought him in. We drafted him in the seventh round out of California. He's a big dude. Mm-hmm. He doesn't. He's the step. I uh, can't even talk right now. He doesn't come across as big as he is, but when you see him in person, you say, wow, that's a big running back. So maybe that's your guy. You know, Maybe they bring in Lasko, who's younger than high calorie, knows the system, and he might only get five carries. But what did I just say a couple minutes ago about Adrian Peterson? Well, you lost those couple carries, right? Mm-hmm. So well, maybe you bring third back, he gets five carries, and that's able to help out balance running the ball. And, and here's the thing about Lasko. Lasko's still good out of the backfield. He can catch the ball, too. Uh, Lasko, to me, reminds me so much of how Duke's – was his first couple of years in New Orleans. Uh, his bid, his build uh, and body type is kind of similar to Deuce. I'm not saying he's Deuce, guys. I'm saying he, re- he reminds me of Deuce. Uh, but still, I mean, you make a very good point about Tim Hightower being there. I just don't know if Sean Payton has a lot of confidence in Lasko, uh, especially with the fumble issues he had during preseason. So, and he had an, enough opportunities to be able to win that uh, final running back spot, but they didn't give it to him. They gave it to uh, Edmonds instead. So in Edmonds, I just thought Edmonds was still more of a. Mix when it comes to the uh, kickoff uh, game. So why not bring it? in Lasko or why don't we bring in Tim Hightower? Yeah, it's still an option. And hopefully after this game, we'll see if that's the direction the Saints choose to go into. Or what about Darius Victor? Practice. Who had a pretty good preseason. Yeah, he's still green though. Um, I, I, I think they still don't have a lot of confidence in him. He's still, needs to be able to pick up the the blitzes if he's going to be in the backfield if because you don't want here's the deal you don't want the backfield to be totally one dimensional right rim because oh, every every time re, remember there was a time when every time Mark Ingram would get the ball there was a 90% right. chance he was going to run the ball so right then the linebackers cl- played up bam stuff to play Right. Same thing Soon with Adrian ball, Peterson. Right, there in his face. right. And I think this is why Adrian Peterson, uh, guys, was having such a problem in New Orleans because if he's going to be in the game, there's a 90% chance he's just going to run the ball. <laughs> that, that was it, guys. I mean, it, it wasn't rocket science to some of the opposing defenses that when these guys come, certain guys come into the game, we know the dimension that's going to be attacked at us, and that's how they attack the Saints. So, all right, guys, uh, and good points, man. Very good points. Now, let me ask you this, uh, Bryn. This kid, Hundley, uh, I know I watched him a little bit a couple years ago when he was with UCLA. We would get some of his games here in Houston uh, late at night, those Pacific uh West games were right there, and he was a really talented young man out there. Why did they decide to stick with this kid and not have any insurance behind him in Green Bay? What are your thoughts there? I think the one thing with with Hundley is that if he had came out at the right time, 
a lot of people had him as a first, second, or maybe even a third round pick. Right? This kid could have been a you know, one of the first four quarterbacks taken off the board. Now, unfortunately, the way the draft worked out, he wasn't. He was a fifth-round pick, if I'm not mistaken. It might have been a sixth-round pick. I think he's got everything you want. You talk about intangibles, you talk about build, which nowadays is overrated and underrated, depends who you talk to. He's built to be an NFL quarterback. He's got a good arm. He's mobile. He's mobile and big. Doesn't get much better than that. I think another thing is you have to see what the Packers had done with Aaron Rodgers under Brett Favre. He had to sit Aaron Rodgers. Now, Rodgers, I don't think, is very close to retirement, but having Hundley to be able to sit under Rodgers, learn the playbook, learn from one of the best quarterbacks of this generation, gave an opportunity. And now here is his opportunity. He looked good. He looked bad at times last week. The one thing that I'd be concerned about as a Saints fan, it sounds a little silly, but it's a really good point. When Rodgers didn't play over the last few years, look at the backups and look at the games that they had. Yeah, like Need Flynn. I remind you of Matt Flynn. Matt Flynn, right, Scott exactly. Coles. Right, right. Both those quarterbacks were great when Aaron Rodgers was out because these backups spent so much time in his pocket picking his mind and figuring out how this offense works. But at the same time, the scary thing, especially for Hundley this week, if you're the same defense, you only have, what, one half? of tape to really go over, at least in the Green Bay offense. Nobody knows. You can compare it a lot to basketball. When when a basketball player comes out on the floor for the first time, well, you don't know his hot spots. You don't know his style of play. The tape's not there. You're not sitting there looking at tape throughout the week going, okay, well, this quarterback only, let's say he only scrambles out right. Maybe he only breaks the pocket right. You don't have any of that. Right. You don't know. You don't know his chemistry with the receivers, anything. But that's also scary for Green Bay because they're sitting at the same time. They're like, we don't, we don't know what we have. We do and we don't. Well, here's he what no scares idea. me, Brent. And, Remy, you and I, and <laughs> we've been through this over the years. Every time the Saints have a replacement quarterback or rookie quarterback or a quarterback that's filling in for the injured starter – what usually happens, Rem? Get ripped up. <laughs> <laughs> ripped up. RG3 is the one that comes to my mind. Oh, man, look. Uh, RG3, I can go back. Luke McCown, when he was with Tampa Bay, remember? Ripped the Saints up. Uh, what was the, I, remember the, some, the, I remember some kid named Joe Montana made his name against the Saints. Exactly. Uh, there was a... <laughs> What's the kid, uh, Freeman, with Tampa Bay when he was a rookie? Winston, remember? Rookie. <laughs> Second game against the Saints. I mean, there are times where these guys have made names for themselves just because they're, they're filling in for or starting for the first couple of times in their career. So that's a concern of mine. Not saying it's going to happen, who that nation, but – we don't need this game to be a trap game for the Saints. We need this game to be the game where the Saints make that leap forward, right? And it's fitting that exactly. it's going to happen, at, and it can happen at Lambeau Field. This team has to be there to take care of business. Now, remember I was saying last week it was time for them to prove it? All right, so, okay, you took care of business. You proved to the – De- especially the defense that you belong in the, t- the the discussion in the NFC. Now, can we make that leap forward? Can we win the games we are due to win or supposed to win? Right, Bren, right, Rem? It has to be there that we take care of those games. Uh, Hundley, he threw three interceptions last game. I don't know if you're going to get three interceptions out of this kid this game because you still have Jordy Nelson. You still have Devontae Adams, right? You still have Montgomery in the backfield. You have Jones in the backfield. He still has a complement of weapons. If the Saints cannot get up on these guys early in that game, right? And this is going to be one of the keys. If we can get on the board early and often and put him under pressure 
and make that team one-dimensional, that's the only way we're going to be able to win. In my oh, opinion, I agree. In my opinion. And, to, and, and of course, some takeaways, but we've, we've got to be the aggressor on Sunday. So, so definitely. Yeah, that's definitely. how I see it. I don't think there's anybody who would disagree with that, Kyle. It's, it's, it's um, common sense and to a certain degree. And, um, you know, it's, again, it's like you, both you gentlemen said earlier, is you don't know what to expect from this guy. So you got to put him in a position where, you know, you can exploit his youth and give him them happy feet and, um, back there if he has to drop and drop back and start throwing. You know, you, give him, you make him a little nervous back then where we can pin our ears back and put some pressure on him, you know. So, um, yeah, you, you, you really you really hit it right on the head. That's what's going to have to happen for this to be a, um, a successful week for us. Yeah, because it's still – I mean, they still have the talent surrounding that kid, and I'm pretty sure that McCarthy is going to put in the plays he, the kid is going to be comfortable with. Kind of what the Houston Texans are doing with uh, Deshaun Watson. Put in the plays – and, you know, you, you said it – uh, Remy a second ago, it's not rocket science, it's kind of com- common sense, right? Why haven't these offensive coordinators and coaches started to figure out, if you have a rookie in the game, you don't just give him the whole playbook and say, and if he didn't learn it, oh, he's dumb. Or oh, he doesn't understand. He can't comprehend. The NFL is complex enough. So give these guys a the plays that they're going to be comfortable with that they can possibly have higher percentage in doing and excel or give them the chance to excel, you know? And, and I noticed some of the uh, coaches are starting to adopt that philosophy versus years ago, you got to do it our way or is no way at all. So, and we got to realize that uh, Bryn, this kid is mobile too. And the saints, are susceptible to mobile quarterbacks. Yeah, it's it's one of those things, especially with him, that it's not necessarily when you say – when I say mobile, the first thing that comes to my mind, I'm thinking guys like Michael Vick. I'm thinking no, RG3 like right. before the knee injuries. Mm-hmm. But he's not that type of mobile. Right. When I He's more of a Big Ben mobile. He can move around the pocket, and he can get out of the pocket if he has to. And you saw it at UCLA a little bit as well. Because of his big frame, especially towards the goal line, not a big deal if he's able to break containment and go in for a five-yard touchdown run or anything like that. It's going to be interesting to see how the Saints defend him this week. The first thing, I'm going to kind of take a play out of Greg Williams' playbook. Go at him. Pressure him. See what he's made of. And that's how you should start. The week, in my opinion, if you're New Orleans, your defense is already riding high, you've had all those turnovers, go try to make a play that first series. Yeah. And make him uncomfortable, put him under pressure, and see what he's made of. Yeah. Now, thanks so much for having me on the show. No problem, man. Uh, I'm happy to join you guys when I can. Obviously, things are getting a little hectic. Like I said, nine sports, a radio show of my own, uh, and I got nothing uh, for you guys but to say thank you for giving me the platform to kind of build off of here at the Saints News Network. It's It's been great to go and, and do some other things, but I always got you guys anytime I can join on a Wednesday night. Hey, no problem. Oh, man. Same here. Same here, man. Do your thing, Brendan. Do your thing, man. And um, Hey, that soccer game you had today, did um, any ladies run around and pull off their – Jersey. Forget about. Forget I asked that. All right. Oh my goodness. All right, Brent. How can the people follow you before you leave, Doc? Uh, people can follow me at on Twitter. It's at bt boylan. That's b t b o y l a n. I have the Butler's Pantry every Tuesday and Thursday. That's at four o'clock Eastern time. Uh, for you guys out of the network, it'll be wgwg.org. And I'm on the Big South Network pretty consistently, and if that's not on local TV, you can catch that online as well. That's bigsouthsports.com. Hit the watch tab and find Gardner Webb. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be me 
uh, commentating that. And if you guys have the chance, October the 24th, I believe the kickoff's at noon. I'll be on the radio play by playing uh, Gardner Webb University versus Liberty University, the Battle of the Baptist Schools. Oh, Liberty. Uh, wow. Be- yeah. Liberty University. Yeah. Yeah, big school, man. Well, yeah, um, well, they did some big things at the, what week one with that upset, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, they they were in the Big South Conference for a long time. This is their final year that they're in the Big South. They're ineligible for postseason play because they're moving to the FBS next year as an independent. So this is the last time we'll probably see Liberty for a long time. It's a good rivalry. Like I said, it's the Battle of the Baptists, and that game will be on WGWG dot org i was fortunate enough to actually call the tv broadcast the last home game that was october the 7th i got to call that game against shorter university in uh they're from georgia right outside of rome so if you guys uh like what i do as an analyst here uh, i'd be honored if you guys gave me a listen uh for play-by-play football or play-by-play anything whether it be volleyball soccer hey look, i even man. have wrestling on the schedule this year so you don't, you don't have That's to worry right. about that just just remind this old mind uh exactly when it's going to happen <laughs> and i'll be listening okay also hey, I'll, if I'll i can call it online in. and you guys are welcome to share it. and don't forget also if you ever get that call-in number what we can do to try to call in on those tuesdays and thursdays well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'll be okay. posting that online. Uh, and like I said, if you guys want to share anything on any of those pages, you're more than welcome to. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to check out because I'm a big volleyball fan, man. People don't know that about me, but I'm really, really into volleyball. Yeah, I actually just why, left a game today. Why are, you, why are um, you into volleyball? So. Why are you into volleyball is the problem. Hey, I, uh, I, <laughs> you gotta get, listen, volleyball has been a sport I actually got – an opportunity to call that for the first time four years ago. My dad was an assistant coach at the JV level uh, where I went to high school, and I had to learn on the fly. I had no idea anything about this sport, and I was calling it. It was on the list that year, and it's actually became one of my favorite sports to commentate because it's very much like football or very much like basketball. It's very fast-paced, and there's not a lot of – very fun to watch. It's very fun to commentate, especially when it's done well. Mm. Right. Right. Okay. And I just I just left a game today. Um, high school rivalry locally, St. St. Mary's Academy against um, St. Catherine's Drexel Prep. Um, you know that's the school where I work, St. Mary's Academy. We unfortunately lost to um, St. Catherine's Drexel, but very very good game today from both schools. And I actually worked at St. Catherine's Drexel a couple of years ago, so I got to see some of my students from both schools go against each other as they do every year, uh, and it was really really enjoyable to see. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Bryn, what's your uh, your pick for the game before you leave? Man, I'm going to go optimistic here. You know, the Saints on the road, Lambeau's a hard place to play. Fortunately, you don't have to face Aaron Rodgers. I still think Hundley kind of gets his feet under him. He's got the home crowd behind him. So I'm going to go Saints. I'm going to go something along the lines of about 34 to 21. And I think that Green Bay scores late kind of garbage time touchdown. So it's really more like a 20-point win for New Orleans. Uh, that's my optimism speaking, uh, that the defense comes out and irritates the young quarterback, and that the offense can get something going, especially when you have a full receiving core and you have running backs that are running angry and, and running proud. I think Ingram's not just running angry. I think he's running proud because he held off a future Hall of Famer from stealing his job. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. I like it. We'll talk to you later, man, and we'll uh, be looking for that information on your calls next week, okay? All right. I appreciate it. Hey, peace, love, positivity. Spread it around, guys. We don't. We have so much negativity in the world, but, you know, the one thing, and sounding a little bit like a hippie here, the one thing you can do, you can spread peace, love, and positivity to people. You don't know how much that impacts a person's day. So I'll see you guys later. That's right. All right, Brendan. All right. You take care, man. That's Brendan Boylan. Gordon Webb, the voice of Gordon Webb and the Butler's Pantry. All right, uh, Rim, let's kind of close this out, man. Uh, I got a feeling how you're going to pick, but tell me what's your your thoughts on the game on Sunday against the Packers? Okay, man. Brendan, you said it, um, and you said it as well. 
there's still all those weapons that were uh, that um, are on that Packers team. But I think you have to subtract at least 14 points that they would have normally had had um, Aaron Rodgers been there. So, you know, I mean, you're never happy when any player gets injured, but this came at an opportune time for us, and I think it's going to um, benefit us. So I'm going to be optimistic as well, and I expect the Saints to win, but I'm not giving it as big of a gap as um, – Brendan gave. I'm giving him more of a seven to ten point gap, but I do expect the Saints to win this week. Yeah, I think it's going to be close too, man, because of the fact number one, the kid had a full week to prepare. Those wide receivers and those weapons uh, are going to rally around him. Uh, McCarthy is going to game plan as well as he can. Uh, still, you got to be careful of Jordy Nelson anytime he's on the field. And this kid, Devontae Adams, has really been coming into his own since last season. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be a close one, man. It has to be one of those games where the Saints defense gives Drew and those guys a couple extra possessions in order to be able to win this game in the special teams have to be able to play like coach Rick Gailey would always say special. All right, guys. Uh, don't forget you can read up every morning about the new Orleans saints on saints news network.com with Barry Hurstis and his featured columns, as well as you can check us out on tune in and stitcher as well as iHeartRadio now. So we are on those stations. And get this, you can always say, Alexa, play Saints News Radio and on TuneIn. Or you can say, Spreaker, play Saints News Radio. So we are featured two different places using your Amazon Echo. All right, we have, to, we have to give a demo of that next week, huh? Okay, well, hey, we can do one right now. Let's see here. Alexa, play Saints News Radio on TuneIn. I cannot play by genre on TuneIn. See, she she messing up. <laughs> she would mess up. Alexa, play Saints News Radio on TuneIn. Okay. Turned it down, and that's what our old show was. Came up, so we are on tune in, guys. So, um, one last thing, Bryn, me and uh, Remy, man, I just got to say this. Uh, let's keep praying for our police officers in the city of New Orleans. I know you lost a yeah. fellow. shooting um the mcneil family correct so let's keep that family in our prayers guys Uh, also let's continue to pray for our nation we need some healing done uh there's too much strife uh going on and unfortunately it's a lack of leadership that's perpetuating a lot of this strife if you want to acknowledge it or not uh and let's just make sure that even though we are fans and we say we are fans and we can root every time a player gets up there and does a great thing and has a great play remember those same players have to go home and they're under the same laws of the united states of america and they have to feel safe when they go home as well. That's from anybody. It doesn't matter what race, color, creed, or who you are. We have to feel safe in the United States of America. All right, guys. Wanna, go ahead. Can I pick it back in there real quick, Carl? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Every purple night, I want to say, I just found out recently, man, that that's the um, seventh purple night to die in, a, in the line of duty as an NOPD officer. Oh, wow. um, so, um, a, a purple night to me, you know, a lot of us are on the force and I'm proud of them as, you know, 
as much as I see them out there, um, I see them at the games. I see them in the community. I see them at the Saints games providing security and Pelicans games providing security and things of that nature. And um, so just like you would be, you know, proud of any person who gave their life for their country, I'm proud for those guys, um, those Purple Knights who given their lives um, to protect our city as well. So right. I just want to say that before we leave. Yeah, yeah, definitely. As well as uh, remember the veterans. Uh, that's important. My father served. My uncle served. My great uncle served in France when he wasn't allowed to pick up a weapon, but he was able to dig latrines. <laughs> that's and yeah. but he served. Are important. He served right. And it doesn't matter, guys. And we've got to put this race thing out of in perspective. We are Americans. If we care about the flag more than we care about our own people, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's a problem. That doesn't mean we're united in this country. That's just my opinion. And if you want to hit me up, hit me up. It doesn't matter. I still believe what I believe. I teach my son to respect the country because I've been around the world. This is a great country, but it doesn't mean just because we're a great country, we don't have flaws. Right. Bottom line. All right, guys. All right, Rim, man, it's good talking to you as always, my buddy. Um, yeah, my brother. Look, man, uh, just keep it keep safe uh, and keep teaching the, the young people the way you're doing. And I'm really proud of you. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to connect again on next week. This is Kyle T. Mosley with Remy, the professional Jones. You guys have a great one. And our boys in black and gold bring back another W from Lambeau field. Okay. Peace. Let's do it. Take care. <laughs>